good afternoon everyone welcome to today's indian session today is the seventh session of uh, geriatric psychiatry today we have with us two distinguished speakers dr keshav kumar who is professor and consultant of uh, neuropsychology and cognitive neurosciences here at uh, nimhans we also have professor uh, santosh loganathan who is a consultant in geriatric psychiatry here at nimhans they would be speaking on cognitive training and cognitive stimulation in dementia and caregiver intervention in dementia we welcome you both sir uh, so uh, thank you chetan can i start yes the uh, we'll hand over the stage to dr uh, keshav kumar sir you can go ahead thank you chetan uh, i'll be talking on cognitive training and cognitive stimulation in dementia as we all know aging refers to an inevitable change in physiological psychological social and occupational functioning in an organism over a period of time neuroimaging studies suggest that brain reaches maximum volume by adolescence and steadily declines from early to middle middle adulthood but the decline is not uniform some functions decline quite early while some other functions decline quite late so what you see here on the graph on the left side is fluid intelligence which peaks up by around 23 years and starts declining after that fluid intelligence is the ability to ability for abstract reasoning and thinking while the crystallized intelligence is the knowledge that we have gained over a period of time uh, uh, information about the world and the uh, uh, the other issues that we have learned over a period of time that peaks by 36 and drops only by 71 years of age but there's an accelerated decline in cognition overall generally after 55 years of age so individual uh, since the cognitive uh, decline doesn't happen uh, uh, there's a there's an individual difference in the way the cognitive uh, deficits occur and this individual difference is uh, uh, referred to as cognitive reserve cognitive reserve is the ability of the brain to cope with pathology by using compensatory mechanism individuals with higher cognitive reserve would cope better with the same amount of pathology than individuals with lower cognitive reserve even if the brain size is the same so there are many factors which contribute to cognitive reserve which is the resilience of the brain pre morbid level of occupational functioning if the individual is involved in high level occupation functioning that also you know adds to the cognitive reserve high level of intellectual functioning higher education physical activity social functioning and of course cognitive retraining as well the dictum of use it or lose it is very important when we talk about cognitive function it has been theorized that change in everyday experience and activity may result in disuse and consequently reducing cognitive processes and skills for example if somebody who is very high functioning retires and starts leading a sedentary life the chances of his cognitive his or her cognitive function diminishing is is quite high therefore it is essential to keep the brain functions stimulated just like physical activity so when you look at the continuum of normal aging to dementia normal aging is caused by mic microstructural changes people experience subtle cognitive decline in attention memory speed of processing and executive function typically some of them experience or perform one standard deviation below the mean on standardized neuropsychological test and there's no disease of the central nervous system mci is a interface between normal aging and dementia some of them may have behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia there are two types of uh, mci that is amnestic mci non amnestic mci amnestic mci uh, patients have difficulty with memory while the non amnestic have with Uh, executive uh, dysfunction but some of the amnestic mci may have other uh, cognitive deficits as well and which has been changing in the recent uh, studies to make a diagnosis of mci they need to perform 1.5 standard deviation below the mean on a standardized neuropsychological test on one or more domains there is pathology evident in entorhinal cortex intraparietal inferior parietal lobes and amygdala entorhinal cortex is an important area of memory circuitry where information processed by the frontal lobe is stored in the uh, entorhinal cortex for a short while where it compiles the contextual cues and the content and 
the information is transmitted to the hippocampus to subiculum. So it becomes a very important region for memory losses. So coming to dementia per se, behavior, behavioral and psychological symptoms are evident in uh, dementia. They perform, uh, the performance falls below two standard deviation from the uh, mean on a standard neuropsychological test. There is pathology in multiple regions. Therefore, the presentation and the cognitive deficits also can be quite large. There, there is an interplay between cognitive deficits as well as behavioral and psychological symptoms. When the patient experiences cognitive deficits, there's a reduced ability to cope with the environmental demand, resulting in anxiety and depression as well as aggression in some of the patients in the early stages. Therefore, improving cognitive functions in individuals in the prodromal, prodromal as well as early dementia could potentially improve overall well-being. Coming to neuropsych rehabilitation, neuropsychological rehabilitation is an application of neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience to improve cognitive functions in acquired brain damage or psychiatric conditions. Uh, cognitive re retraining, cognitive training, cognitive stimulation, all these are used interchangeably uh, in many, many studies. So when we look at the entire gamut of cognitive stimulation, it's all put under the umbrella of cognitive oriented treatments. So as the disease progresses, there's severity uh, increases, there is uh, symptomatology change as well as the cognitive deficits worsen over a period of time from my healthy normal aging to MCI to mild dementia and to moderate dementia. So cognitive retraining and cognitive stimulation, cognitive remissions therapy also would change according to the severity. Cognitive training is more to restore function. It is a standardized task to uh, promote plasticity in certain regions of the brain and to bring about uh, changes in the cognitive function. While cognitive stimulation is more, uh, uh, I mean, less intense and uh, more to maintain the uh, cognitive functions. And reminiscence therapy is to kind of stimulate and keep the mind agile to the extent possible. So cognitive oriented uh, uh, treatment is an umbrella term referring to a group of non-pharmacological intervention with specific focus on improving and maintaining cognitive processes and its impact on functional ability in daily life. There are a number of studies on cognitive intervention in uh, healthy normals, MCI and dementia. So some of the meta-analysis uh, analysis of the studies show uh, that the computer uh, based cognitive intervention program improves cognitive function in older people with MCI. However, the long-term transfer of these improvements and the potential to reduce dementia prevalence remains largely unknown. Now, this is one of the largest studies on healthy normal individuals known as advanced cognitive training for independent and vital elderly known as active. The sample consisted of 2,832 people uh, recruited from 1998 to 2001, age ranged from 65 to 94 years, recruited from the community, clinics, and hospital. Uh, they underwent a 10-session group training. They, they were trained in three different distinct cognitive interventions. One was memory, speed of processing, and reasoning. So memory training typically targets verbal episodic memory. Participants were taught to use mnemonic strategies for remembering word, word list sequences of items, text material, and main ideas and details and gists of the story. Participants were trained how to organize word list into meaningful categories and visualize the meaning into images and make mental associations to recall the words and the text. Exercise involved recalling list of nouns, paragraphs, shopping list, uh, lists of prescription labels. So this is a typical technique used across conditions and across severity. Even in uh, very many schizophrenia studies and TBI, you find uh, this as a main stay of uh, cognitive retraining for memory functions. So reasoning uh, training focused on ability to solve problems that follow a serial pattern. For example, identifying pattern, patterns in a letter or number series or understanding patterns in everyday activities such as travel schedule was encouraged. They could, these could be both individual sessions or group activity. So coming to speed of processing, which focuses on visual search skills and ability to identify and locate visual information quickly on a screen and distractors could be added to increase the uh, complexity of the task. 
Difficulty was manipulated by decreasing the duration of the stimuli, that is the exposure, adding either visual or auditory distractors to make the focus more difficult, increasing the number of tasks to be performed, that is simultaneously they are engaged in two or more tasks, which becomes divided attention paradigms, uh, or the stimulus is presented on a larger or wider expanse or area of the screen, so the search becomes more difficult. Difficulty is increased each time they achieve the criterion performance. So most often the criterion performance is about 80 to 90% of correct responses over two or three sessions, then they go to the next level. So these patients from active study were uh, followed up after 11 months, 60% of them were randomly selected and 75, they underwent a booster session for 75 sessions, uh, for a 75 minute session for two or three week period. They found significant improvement on trained tasks. However, there was no evidence of transfer of training to everyday functioning after two years. So this transfer of training has been a big issue in cognitive retraining. Transfer from trained tasks to untrained domain may depend on the nature of the task and the way the tasks are designed. So this transfer is known as near transfer and far transfer, and also transfer to everyday activity. So habit is one of the uh, uh, most important study which has looked at very intensive cognitive training. Habit is a unique multimodal behavioral intervention offered by Mayo Clinic. It is a five hour per day, five day per week, two week program for individuals with MCI. The five one hour components include daily physical activity. That's one hour of uh, physical activity, computer-based cognitive exercises, patient and family education, separate support group for MCI and partners, memory support system and compensation training, probably encouraging external use of external memory aids, memory diaries and notebooks and uh, uh, such kind of uh, external memory aids. There are a number of commercial cognitive training programs and cognitive uh, training is a billion dollar industry. And the first uh, training program that came into the market was by Dr. Kawashima, The Age of Your Brain, which used uh, a Nintendo console with the screens on two sides. On one side of the screen, a question was presented and the other side of the screen, which is a touch screen, the patient was required to write the answer as rapidly as possible. This is another activity from the same game, uh, which says, oh, look, a party, people are about to enter and exit this house. People will go in and out count those inside the house, which means the patient has to remember who came out, how many have come out and how many are inside the house, requires a multiple component and none of the cognitive uh, uh, domain is a unitary in nature, they're all overlapping. So as the cognitive load increases, there's very many other cognitive functions that gets engaged and multiple networks get engaged to mediate the cognitive load. So in, on this task, the idea is to do it as quickly as possible and uh, reduce the age of the brain. So this is a typical example of how a test can be converted into game, gamification of test. I'm just using this example to explain that. So this is there is a typical psychological paradigm known as NBAC test where the patient has to respond to a target one before the one presented now. So that is converted into a game where the frog has to jump on a, on a leaf that gets highlighted one before that it will be the tar target or two before that if it's an NBAC2 paradigm. So what are the issues in cognitive retraining? This issue, these issues are uh, uh, relevant for cognitive retraining across conditions and across domains. So there's no agreed upon theory for cognitive retraining. No guidelines on how to develop cognitive tasks, what domains to train and how to train, how many sessions for how long. So that's the dose and the intensity of the session, how to increase the levels of difficulty, are the changes associated with training retained or enduring over a period of time? Is there near and far training? That is the task trained will transfer to the untrained task and generalization. So whatever change that is seen on the pre and post test, will that generalize to everyday life? If there's no generalization to everyday life, probably the cognitive retraining is not effective. So these are the typical issues that people in the field of cognitive retraining face. So coming to Niman's experience, for the last 30 years, Neuropsychology Unit at Niman's has been developing theoretically based cognitive training program. The challenge for India is to develop a simple task with simple material that's available in every Indian home, which is time and cost effective programs to cater to all strata of the society. 
the programs can be both hospital based as well as home based programs so this is a model that we have developed for the last 30 years and we started our work with tbi then stroke and other neurological condition and moved on to you know psychiatric condition like schizophrenia depression dementia epilepsy so what we developed was all conditions the primary cognitive dysfunctions are in the domains of attention speed of processing executive function and memory and we realized that training attention and executive functions will actually transfer in addition to uh, encoding would enhance overall cognitive functions and symptom reduction that we saw in head injury patients with 30 sessions of uh, training and we moved on and we tightened the uh, training program over 30 years and the, currently we are using a 18 session program for dementia uh, mcis and other psychiatric conditions so the changes in cognitive functions and the symptom reduction will facilitate generalization and return to employment so if there's a change in the cognition and mastery over task and this task should be accommodated in the brain probably in terms of plasticity therefore you know bringing about neural uh, plasticity so the rational for rehabilitation the rational for rehabilitation is the notion that practice on carefully selected task promote recovery of the disrupted circuitry and restore functions in the impaired cognitive processes themselves the task mediated by the circuitry are then performed in a way similar to non brain damage individuals there is a lot of literature to support this so the mechanism mechanism of recovery is plasticity which is a buzzword in cognitive retraining uh, there are two uh, plasticity refers to the intrinsic capacity of the brain to respond to internal or external stimuli or uh, demands there are two kinds of plasticity one is spontaneous recovery one is ex experience dependent recovery and most rehab professionals work more on the experience dependent Uh, recovery so from my experience with the several conditions we developed a cognitive training program for dementia which was a dst funded project uh, we developed eight domains of cognitive retraining uh, uh, with eight levels of difficulty this is domains where working memory short term verbal and visual memory visual memory uh, and verbal memory and memory for stories response animation activity and as well as reasoning so we took this ta i mean program which is a paper pencil program for 30 days to the community as well as clinical sample so our uh, staff went to the community and contacted patients from uh, welfare association and gave cognitive retraining on a daily basis for one hour so what we found was after the intervention the time taken on attention task significantly reduced the uh, omissions and uh, commissions also reduced significantly on digital span and uh, special span forward conditions the overall performance increased significantly we also found changes in executive function that is working memory both visual uh, verbal as well as visual spatial working memory as well as fluency so you can see the, the changes on the pre post on fluency as well as working memory task so another major problem in elderly is the memory so we saw changes improvement after intervention on acquisition of information across trials on word list and logical passage as well as visual learning and memory immediate and delayed recall scores so uh, simultaneously we conducted cognitive training on patient population with six mci six mild uh, alzheimers two patients with the parkinsons one patient with the ftd similar to the healthy normals patients also showed decreased time commissions omissions on attention task uh, digit span forward did not improve but digit span uh, special span forward did improve significantly executive functions also improved the fluency task both fruit animals and vegetables improved significantly working memory showed small changes which are special uh, skills there was a significant change the most important thing was the improvement was seen on both verbal and visual learning and memory task with ir and dr the dr delayed recall significantly improved very significantly so the training was not restricted only to cognitive uh, a test we also found the transfer of these changes on all the scores on the scales so ghq ghq neurological screening 88 easy the test of everyday functioning and neuropsychiatry inventory as well as uh, 
clinical dementia rating scale and geriatric depression scores, all of them came down with uh, intervention on the post assessment, suggesting that there was a generalization uh, from the cognitive task to multiple domains as well as on, on the outcome measures. So we digitized the entire cognitive program uh, and uh, Adobe came forward to digitize this program for us. And uh, we uh, developed, uh, we administered this on seven elderly, elderly, normal elderly, age uh, between 55 to 80 years, years, 18 sessions, each session lasting for 30 sessions, I mean, 30 minutes. Results showed that there's a significant improvement in attention, speed of processing, total learning on word list, delayed recall and story test, as well as visual learning and memory, even in healthy normals on the app. So this is these are these are snapshots of uh, screenshots of uh, the domains that we have done. Uh, these are uh, this is visual memory. This is verbal memory. This is response inhibition. This is working memory. So the tasks are constructed in such a way that even severe patients should be able to do the first level, and healthy, normal, high functioning patient should be able to struggle on the task and find it difficult. So we have a, a range of activities in this, this app, which can cater to the entire spectrum of healthy normal aging to dementia and patients with severe cognitive deficits. So this is the a graph to represent the pre post change. The red bars are the post and the blue bars are the pre. We saw changes across a number of domains of cognitive functions. This is another graph showing for improvement on many neuropsychological tests. So coming to cognitive stimulation therapy, cognitive stimulation therapy is a milder form of cognitive retraining. Uh, it is one of the non-pharmacological intervention for people with dementia, including a range. It includes a range of fun activities to improve cognitive function in patients with dementia. The primary aim of this intervention is to improve thinking, concentration, memory in a group setting. Cognitive stimulation activities are not aimed at systematic improvement of a particular cognitive domain, unlike cognitive retraining, considered as stimulating and generally good for the brain. So typical cognitive stimulation therapy is 14 session intervention twice a week, lasting for about 45 minutes to one hour. There could be some uh, physical activity or exercise in some of the programs. It's a group activity with five to eight people in the group. The number of groups, uh, the members of the groups are generally identical in terms of severity of cognitive, uh, severity of illness, as well as level of cognitive functioning. The session could include the following activities. There'll be an introduction uh, session where they have to introduce themselves or call people by name. Every individual may have a name tag to facilitate uh, remembering the name. There'll be a group song that will be that is decided by the group and selected by the group, which they have to sing. There'll be a small brief discussion on current affairs, and there'll be main activities. The main activities will be discussion on a range of topics, including past, present events, topics of interest, current styles, fashion, word games, puzzles, movies. There'll be practical activities such as cooking, baking for about 45 minutes to one hour. Patients with more impairment, uh, CS2 will focus more on the reality orientation therapy, kind of, you know, trying to uh, get them to name days, days of the week, uh, I mean, time and place. So this is one typical activity where they will be given a ball with the, uh, an activity sprinted on them and they can choose one activity and start talking about a particular uh, topic. So systematic reviews show minimal changes in ADLs, social functioning, and quality of life. But meta-analysis reveals inconsistent results with regard to quality of life. Coming to the last form of therapy is the reminiscence therapy. Development of reminiscence therapy can be traced to Butler, 1963, in which individuals look back at the past experience, unresolved difficulty and conflicts. RT involves discussion about patients' past activities, events, and experience using external aids such as photographs, video clips, uh, household items from the past. Piquot did a review of 100 studies and he classified uh, reminiscence therapy into three types. Simple reminiscence where the individual recalls selected personal stories of her life. Life review, this type is more structured and evaluative process. Usually individual therapy is covering the whole life in a chronological order. Here, the focus is to integrate both positive and negative memories as the patient elaborates them. The third one is life review therapy. This therapy is primarily used for individuals with depression, depressed mood, and other mental difficulties. Aim is to regulate, uh, re-evaluate negative memories and promote 
past life, a past view, I'm mean, sorry, positive view of life. Emphasis is to develop a narrative biography integrating past, present, and future. These effects of RT are comparable to medication as well as other psychosocial intervention with this group. To conclude, cognitive retraining program is, uh, improves cognitive function in normals, MCI, as well as individuals with dementia. With the progression of severity of dementia, cognitive stimulation and reminiscence therapies are useful in, in improving cognitive function and quality of life and keep the brain agile to the extent possible. However, there's a need for better intervention methods to improve quality of life and uh, independent living. And the interventions uh, should be looked at more in theoretical uh, underpinnings. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation, sir. Thank you, Chetan. Now, uh, we'll go to the next part of the presentation uh, by Dr. Santosh Loganathan. Uh, uh, Santosh, sir. Can you hear me, Chetan? Yes, sir. You can go ahead. Okay. Great. Okay. I'll just share my uh, screen now. Are you able to see my uh, screen, uh, Chetan? Uh, it is uh, starting, sir. It, it may take a while. Okay, okay. It says uh, screen sharing is paused. Is there a problem there? Uh, sir, can you reshare it, sir? Because we are not able to see the screen. Okay, let me stop it and then reshare it. It stopped sharing again. It stopped sharing again? Okay, just wait. Okay, can you see now? Uh, it has started now. Uh, okay, great. It, it, will, it may take some time. Yeah, it has come up now. So. Okay, so good evening to all of you. Um, uh, can you so, make it uh, uh, full screen? Sorry? Uh, can you make the slide? Uh, now it has come. Yeah, it's in full screen now. 
Okay. Yeah, good evening to all of you. So I'll be talking about the caregiver interventions uh, for dementia. Uh, as you all know, caregivers are, you know, uh, an important part of the treatment process itself. A lot of times uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, the uh, individual uh, or the person who has dementia, but um, the caregiver actually goes through a lot of um, unseen uh, uh, events that uh, we as clinicians must know and must realize and recognize uh, to understand what they are going through. Uh, so to understand what is actually the meaning of the word caregiver, uh, you all should know that uh, you know the caregiver could be a family caregiver or an informal caregiver. The informal caregiver is somebody who's uh, an unpaid family member. Basically, they're, they're not being paid for any of their work. Uh, or they could be any of a family or a friend or a neighbor who provides care. And the care could uh, vary from various activities like, you know, bathing, dressing, giving medications to tube feeding uh, and ventilator care. I mean, these might seem very simple, but uh, one must remember that bathing is not just uh, giving a bath, but giving a bath to somebody who is refusing to take a bath, uh, you know, it becomes more challenging or maybe giving a list of uh, multiple medications to uh, someone who is, um, you know, uh, demented. And uh, so there might be some inhalers, some injections, some crushed medications, and so on and so forth. And watching for side effects uh, makes, again, uh, the job description quite uh, challenging. Uh, Chetan, uh, I'm able, I'm not able to see the full screen here. Uh, there are a list of uh, uh, pictures on the right side. Okay, yeah, I got it. Okay, so around 44 million caregivers uh, over the age of 18 um, uh, is the current estimate uh, around the world. This is for any chronic uh, disease. And in terms of um, older adults, nearly two thirds of older adults who actually need help uh, are not getting it from the formal sources. That leaves the informal sources or, or the family caregivers to take up this particular role. And in terms of the older adults, if you look at uh, the numbers, uh, age 65 and older, uh, there is a steady rise from 6.4% uh, in the previous year to almost 8.4% by the year 2030, which means that the number of the elderly, this numbers, I'm sure that you would have all heard it in the last few presentations uh, that have been going on in terms of how the prevalence of dementia is progressively increasing. And uh, in India also, the estimate is that uh, by uh, the year 2030, uh, the numbers would actually double from 4.4 million, which was the estimate in 2015. So all this adds to a lot of social and economic demand on individuals and families caring for you know, the people who have uh, dementia. Now, coming to the Indian social cultural context, uh, you all need to understand that in, in India, the caregiving is pretty much rooted in, you know, the traditional extended family system. Cultural beliefs like the kinship obligation and respect for elders and parents is something that is deep rooted in our uh, society in, in the extended family system. So people have this sense of duty and obligation or maybe they're doing it because nobody else is there to do it. They just have to do it because there's there's no other way. And uh, there's nobody who assigns that this is to be done by so and so. It's just that one person assumes all particular aspects of caregiving. And uh, the moment it comes to dementia, caregiving becomes even more complex and even more intensive. And uh, people are somehow left helpless and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they really kind of struggle with it uh, for most of the time. So uh, if you look at the caregivers in India, pretty much they are women. It might be daughters, daughter-in-laws, or wives of somebody who has a dementia. And uh, they, they are, I mean, I'm not saying that men don't care. It's, it is, it's just that vast, vast majority are women. And in India, there, there is this concept of uh, what is known as offering seva or service or worship. It's almost like offering divine worship to the elderly. The elderly seem like almost one of... In, the, uh, in terms of the power structure in the family, the elder person is, is, is hold, holds the highest amount of respect. So taking physical care of the frail elder could be, you know, applying oil and braiding the hair and changing the clothes and so on. 
and in, in a way this also reveals power that the aging body is now in the process of weakening so how do people understand dementia so most people in india it is seen that they view dementia as a part of normal aging ha ah, he is just forgetting things so that's part of his age he is supposed to be forgetting at this age so as a result what happens is that people are not able to recognize it there are no expectations from the older adults as well and uh, this uh, high tolerance to the disability also leads to a lower recognition of dementia among people they might attribute it to him being a difficult personality he was always a difficult personality all through his life so he's behaving like that now or they might not be open minded enough to accept other medical um, uh, explanations and um, there is also an attribution that the family is not caring much for this person that is why this person is probably behaving like this so there are many such attributions and they might also put the blame back on the person aha uh -huh, he is not putting enough effort uh, himself or herself and that is why this person is behaving like this so various attributions uh you know uh, kind of mask the recognition of uh, dementia in uh, in our society and in addition uh in the healthcare system itself there is a lack of mental health in infrastructure and the scarcity of other resources and residential care and community systems uh, as a result uh, you know it becomes difficult for, for people to actually seek help also and uh, they generally receive very little support for their work of caring uh, people with uh, for people with dementia and as a result this uh, activity becomes progressively more demanding and stressful and frustrating and a lot of caregivers experience tremendous stress i must say that uh, there are a set of people who do experience a lot of satisfaction also in terms of the pride that they have in caring for the elder person in terms of the meaning of life that they realize for caring for caregiving uh, in spite of all of these difficulties many caregivers do choose to provide this care till the very end so what are the kind of challenges that the families go through in india in changing times so if you look at the traditional family structure again a lot is changing now we no longer the big indian family with the extended family we are progressing to much more nuclear family systems and as a result what is happening there is a breakdown of the support system you you don't have the rest of the family members providing the extended social support as a result you are probably dealing with a single family probably providing Uh, support and that becomes all the more stressful for that particular family and that particular individual so the this change in the traditional family structure is something that uh, is happening and india is in that process of change uh, very similar to what is happening in the west we are still not yet there as as in the west but we are in that process and also the change in the traditional gender role of caregiving i talked to you about how the women have been the predominant caregivers in uh, india but over a period of time we are again in that process of ch uh, change where we are seeing more and more women who are in the workforce and uh, they are not actually being uh, able to be available at home for the role of caregiving and as a result you know there are you know, more men also coming into this role of caregiving now so there are changes in this uh, gender role that is also happening in our country and more importantly i think most caregivers in india are still unprepared unprepared because they are just thrust into the role they just happen to be there nobody else is doing it so they happen to do it and they have no idea about how to go about it lack of information about what is actually happening all of this makes them very unprepared and in terms of the hidden costs uh, i i think that uh, there, there is also a possibility of people losing their job and their uh, salary and income that uh, is something that can indirectly apart from the direct costs like you know medicines and hospitalization and um, diapers and so on these indirect costs are something that uh, really play a huge role in terms of uh, caregiving and as a result most people are unable to you know uh, take care on one side and also you know uh, 
balance their work life. So this entire balancing act uh, becomes an issue of you know uh, balancing the work life and their personal life and uh, the caregiving uh, role, which uh, which can get them into a very difficult uh, position. And as a result, people, you know, they put in so much of effort. Many people can become extremely skillful and they can actually master the role of caregiving. But there is a lot of uh, la lack of recognition of this. And as a result, people tend to exclude them. They themselves become lonely. And the stigma of being a caregiver for somebody who has dementia is something that is also um, uh, starts becoming an issue for them. So there is a need for information and in terms of training uh, caregivers, a lot of uh, 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 input needs to go in for these caregivers to understand what it is to be a caregiver for dementia. What is this person going through? And where can I go and seek help in terms of hospitalization or medication or seeing a doctor or seeing any other uh, rehabilitative services? So there's a lot of need for information that is still uh, lacking in, in, in our country. So coming to the basic interventions for the caregivers, uh, I have just simplified in, into these four uh, broad uh, components. Uh, you can look at this article for more information, uh, but most of the interventions can fall into these four broad components. And the, these, uh, this, this particular article is actually, uh, you know, a, com a compilation of uh, most of the uh, evidence base that is available in terms of interventions for caregivers of dementia. So primarily it is the psychoeducation, which is, I think, uh, can be offered in multiple ways. You know, you can offer psychoeducation in, in a form of a group format, and you can offer psych psychoeducation in the form of a one-to-one -one session, or you can offer psychoeducation even in online mode now. So things have really kind of improved as far as psychoeducation uh, is concerned. And psychoeducation is something that can even be offered by a non-skilled person, as in you don't have to have a training for psychoeducation. It can be done by even non-skilled person who has some knowledge uh, about dementia. So it basically offers uh, uh, information about dementia, about the causes, about the uh, treatment available and so on. Uh, the basic information about dementia. The second is uh, in terms of counseling and psychotherapy. And this is predominantly for the caregivers who are under a lot of stress as a result of their caregiving role. And sometimes people might also be slipping into loneliness and depression. And uh, for them, uh, the counseling and psychotherapy, cognitive behavior therapy is something that is found to be useful. And psychotherapy is predominantly for the caregivers who are undergoing a lot of stress and depression. The third is the multi-component interventions, which as the name suggests, has multiple components in it in terms of not just providing psychoeducation, information about dementia. It also gives uh, you know, interventions towards uh, counseling them and taking care of themselves, as also providing the problem solving skills, the coping skills, uh, and other uh, necessary skills that are required for uh, managing a person at home in terms of maybe their activities at home, in terms of uh, how to manage their behaviors, uh, difficult behaviors, and so on. So it is a very integrated um, intervention that encompasses all aspects of caregiving, not just one aspect like, care, like psychoeducation and so on. So it is a, a whole um, a package that is uh, there. And nowadays, these packages are becoming available online as well. Uh, the fourth one is uh, in terms of the mindfulness-based interventions, which make the caregivers focus on the here and now and uh, gets them to uh, you know, slow down in their lives and get them, gets them to look at one thing at a time. And this is something that, again, is found useful. And so are other interventions like yoga and breathing exercises also are something that are now picking up and have been found to be useful for caregivers in terms of reducing their burden, stress, and their uh, uh, quality of life. Now, uh, what, what are the kind of uh, aspects that caregivers uh, what are, the, are looking for when they come to, let's say, the clinic? Uh, often we are predominantly involved as clinicians maybe to look at you know, the person with dementia or his behavior or her symptoms and her sleep and so on. 
but a lot of times uh, we fail to or we might not really focus on what the caregivers need they might be asking us things but if we are not equipped ourselves as clinician to guide them then it it might be a difficult for uh, them to really provide the necessary care at home so uh, there are lots of booklets and lots of information that is available and i, I would suggest this very useful booklet for caregivers it's from the alzheimer's uh, disease international uh, uh, booklet for caregivers it's a very simple booklet which every clinician must go through to understand some of these nuances that uh, go um, that are involved i mean that that's gives you very basic information there are very uh, i mean there are lots of information actually out there in terms of how to look after a person with dementia in fact there's a book called 24 hour uh, um, uh, caring or 10, 24 hour caregiving uh, which is an extensive collection of um, how to go about caring for a person with dementia so let me just go through about some of the basic things that you need to know as a clinician so giving basic information about dementia uh, about the you know the prognosis about the treatment about the causes and about the medication involved this is this is some of the basic information that needs to be given to every caregiver and in terms of the practical tips on managing dementia uh, this can be anything to do with uh, looking after the person at home in terms of having a routine for the person maybe or maybe you know uh, how this person needs to kind of manage a particular day because in, in this whole confused schedule if the person has a routine you know how this person's routine can actually be a way which can uh, offer some sense of control over a particular day and so some some of these aspects about uh, managing a person are uh, can vary from very simple uh, activities like maybe their uh, uh, dressing, for example, uh, uh, you might want to, you know, arrange their clothes in a particular way and then, uh, you know, ask them to, you know, wear it one by one uh, because they might not be able to choose a variety of clothes that they need to wear for that day. They might have difficulty in wearing it. Uh, so you might have to actually give them some sense of uh, 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 help, but at the same time, keep them or make them to remain independent uh, in trying to manage their activities on their own as much as possible. So various activities like even their cooking and you know if they're able to cook to a certain extent it's okay but you might have to also uh, watch out and see if you know they are not harming themselves in, by you know switching off on the gas stove and so on. So in things like driving uh, they might not be able to drive but you might have to uh, advise them or to take the help of a doctor to advise them that they might have to stop driving because it might be dangerous for them to drive. So there are a lot of things that have to uh, be managed over a period of time and it can vary from the severity from the early stage to the moderate stage to the severe stage and these uh, tips need to be given to the caregivers as and when the person is moving from one stage to, a, to the other. Uh, and uh, help them to kind of manage it at, at, uh, at each stage. Then there is also personal and emotional stress of caring. So the entire aspect of caregiving can be stressful. So the caregiver needs to also have some time for themselves, some time for themselves in terms of leisure, in terms of for their own uh, uh, space and uh, relaxation and uh, um, you, know, you know, advise them some breathing exercises or yoga or time away from caring. It can be very difficult because there's nobody else to offer that care. So this kind of respite care uh, provided by any other family or a friend uh, is, is, is something that we need to discuss with them and how they need to take care of themselves in addition to the role of caregiving. That can be a little challenging because they might not just find the time uh, because they're all the time caregiving. So, getting away from caring itself is is something that we have to advise them okay and help for uh, the care basically deals with uh, talking of uh, you know where they can get help a lot of times people are totally clueless about where they need to go for treatment or their services or in terms of medications or the doctor or in terms of the uh, support system uh, uh, and and other rehabilitative services, maybe some respite care or 
sometimes when they need to go up somewhere or when when there is an emergency where they need to take this person all of this information uh, is something that the caregivers also need and uh, for some of the uh, poorer sections of society things like uh, disability benefits or even the old age pension they might not even be availing some of these things so giving information on all of these things would actually go a long way uh, because even with just the uh, benefits they might be able to procure some of these medications that are prescribed for uh, the person with dementia now <clears throat> the reason i put up this is the basic uh, uh, you know uh, timeline of uh, disease progression and how the uh, current state of late diagnosis is made in in terms of how uh, people present because of the lack of information or the pathways to care or in terms of the um, um, lack of information and knowledge they somehow end up coming uh, late and uh, as a result the diagnosis also made late so the recommendation is uh, basically to you know make a timely diagnosis and timely diagnosis basically refers to uh, responding to the patient and care concerns as, as in they might have reached you know a particular service or the healthcare system at some point but at some point we might not have picked it up we might have missed it or because of certain lack of skills or lack of resources available uh, that are available it might be missed and as a result the person might be diagnosed late and that leads to again problems so early diagnosis is something that is stressed upon and rather than proactively screening for a lot of cases in the society it the, the emphasis is on to pick up the cases that are actually coming to the healthcare system and does the early diagnosis benefit yes definitely to the caregivers in terms of optimizing the uh, medical management and it gives them basically the uh, uh, understanding of what this person is going through what has actually happened to this person what has changed and gives them you know uh, the time to make decisions and gives them the um, opportunity to access help that they need to actually seek help for this condition and it's not just forgetfulness that this person is going through and it also gives you know uh, an opportunity to reduce the risk the risks of falls maybe the risk of going away wandering away and so on so a lot of complications can be avoided and indeed uh, this person's the family can also plan for the future in terms of maybe you know his will and so on in terms of uh, planning for uh, certain decisions that are very important maybe this person is a businessman who owns a business or you know, or this person has uh, a lot of property and so on so a lot of things need to be uh, uh, discussed and this uh, early diagnosis gives an opportunity for the for the caregivers and the family members that particular uh, so much of time for them to be prepared for the role of caregiving to prepare for them to understand and get adapted to this particular change uh, that they are going through so early diagnosis is definitely beneficial for caregivers and that is something that we as clinicians need to remember now in terms of the future directions as far as as far as caregivers are concerned i think that it's well i mean acknowledged now that the information support and the skills and the training is required for the caregivers to get them ready for this role and access to information about the uh, the services that are available uh, not just for the person with dementia but also for them as caregivers as to how they can take care of themselves and most of these interventions that we are talking about sometimes tend to be uh, uh, tend to also um, come from high income countries or the western countries and uh, we should also remember that we should be culturally uh, sensitive to some of these interventions because you know in india things are so uh, complex in terms of the belief systems um, not just the belief system but also in terms of the intervention some of the interventions i talk about uh, very western concepts of maybe uh, for example uh, dressing a person let's say a lady who has dementia with maybe um, um uh, very western clothes whereas in, in india the person might be very comfortable wearing a sari and then you know when we are talking about interventions we will have to remember some of these um, culturally um, uh, different 
uh, aspects of caregiving, and then you will have to adapt your interventions to the caregiver accordingly. And also getting the uh, work space more ready for um, looking at them to be a little more flexible in enabling the caregivers to go back and take care of their caregiver and at the same time manage their job and have their jobs so that they can manage the work life um, in, a, in a balanced way. And that is something that we might have to look at in terms of talking to the uh, uh, you know, uh, the employers and so on. In terms of the community, yes, a lot, a lot needs to be done in terms of promoting awareness. And uh, this definitely will improve the understanding and reduce stigma associated with uh, dementia and also promote the uh, younger generation to also be a very important part of the caregiving and not just uh, leave it to one generation and the other generation just does not uh, seem interested. So there needs to be uh, intergeneration solidarity that is required uh, in, in families. And yes, future research to support uh, family caregivers is something that I'm going to talk about uh, a little while later. Um, as far as technology is concerned, how the technology has actually invaded now into caregiver interventions. Um, uh, of course, now with the uh, COVID situation, this is something that we are all do, doing now. And right now we are having this whole thing in an in a online platform. Similarly, a lot of the caregiver interventions are uh, have been made available um, uh, online uh, uh, platform. A lot of them have been uh, given earlier on uh, all over the telephone or just over the internet uh, or in terms of e-learning platforms. And all of these have known to reduce caregiver depression, anxiety, in terms of their burden and also enhance the caregiver's self-efficacy and their mastery and quality of life. Now, a uh, similar tech, uh, online uh, support program for um, uh, caregivers was tested in uh, India and several other low and middle income countries and that was called as iSupport. And basically this iSupport is uh, 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 collaboration with the World Health Organization and uh, Stanford University and uh, was funded by the Alzheimer's Association and basically it, it was a pilot trial to study the effects of an online support program for family caregivers of persons with dementia. Now what was the component of, of this study? I just briefly touched you like I talked to you about the multi-component interventions. This is definitely one of the multi-component intervention because it does have um, aspects on basic information about dementia and what it means to be a caregiver and what the kind of changes that are going through uh, will be they, they will be they will be going through as a caregiver and in addition to that they will there are lessons which talk about um, how they can look after themselves how they can reduce stress and uh, how they can actually look after themselves as well uh, while they are having this uh, task of caregiving. In addition, specific to caring for the person, there is providing everyday care in terms of making meals and uh, you know, taking care of their toileting, incontinence, personal care, and how they can actually you know, schedule a particular routine and so on, as is with managing the challenging behaviors like you know, aggression or um, uh, wandering behavior or you know, delusions and hallucinations and uh, uh, poor judgment and so on. So this has uh, uh, been uh, developed by um, the uh, collaborating agencies and these lessons have been put together by a group of experts from um, the entire uh, globe uh, under the guidance of the World Health Organization. And uh, we actually had, um, uh, I have a small video that I would like to play, uh, maybe you can just tell me if you're able to see it now.
Okay, maybe I'll just play it uh, as it is uh, here in the screen. It's not playing in the uh, screen, yeah. Doesn't matter, Santosh, you may not have time, so might be good to move on with your slides. Yeah, it's a very short video. It's almost done. Can you see it? It's, is it playing? No, it's not playing. It's not playing, is it? I mean, it's, you can see some slide, but it's not. Okay. Can't hear anything. You can't hear the music also? No. Okay, no problem. I'll uh, go ahead uh, with the slides then. So for those of you who uh, want to know more about this particular uh, study, this is uh, the study protocol is uh, published already and it's available uh, uh, online. And uh, they, we also have published another uh, study, which is the uh, perspectives on the components as in what the caregivers actually wanted uh, in this particular uh, program is uh, given in a separate um, uh, paper. And the, uh, the pilot, uh, uh, RCT is also on the verge of being published and uh, that will be published very soon. So we did find that um, uh, it, it was not easy for caregivers to actually come out and uh, you know spend a lot of time online. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of these interventions you know are probably uh, suited for those who are you know tech savvy and the ones who are you know comfortable using. Um, a computer and English speaking and so on for the urban population. Um, no, but I, I, I guess that, uh, you know, this is something that uh, will be the future in terms of how things can evolve with the uh, smartphones uh, being available now in the country or with almost, uh, you know, uh, a large proportion of the population and uh, a lot of support and a lot of training can be provided through just the phone and i'm sure that now uh, these are things uh, and signs of things to come in the future uh, in terms of self uh, self help uh, groups uh, i think that this is something that caregivers do uh, look out for uh, there are a few that are listed here uh, some of them are uh, you know uh, predominantly in bangalore and uh, some of these are uh, websites that you all can go and uh, look at uh, for more information. And uh, um, uh, the dementia care notes is something that uh, is uh, it's replete with a lot of information and resources and tips. Uh, it is actually uh, run by a person who's a caregiver herself. Uh, with a lot of stories uh, about how she cared for her own mother and various other caregiver stories and uh, lots of information about uh, caregiving. And of course, the RC, the Alzheimer's and Related Disorders Society of India, it uh, has 14 chapters across the country and it is an NGO that supports uh, uh, people and uh, families with uh, dementia in India. Um, the Nightingale's Medical Trust, and there are a host of other uh, organizations that uh, care for uh, people with uh, dementia, which I'm sure that uh, uh, will be useful for caregivers to go and actually uh, have a sense of uh, belonging uh, in, some, in some way, because they will be able to share their uh, uh, stories and feelings with other caregivers and uh, that will give, give them also a sense of uh, you know being empowered that they are not alone in this journey and that there are other people and they could learn from other people as well just like how we have uh, self-help or support groups for various other conditions uh, there are several self-help uh, and support groups uh, as well uh, that comes to the end of uh, the presentation for today uh, these are some of the references that uh, you might be interested in thank you
sir thank you for the excellent presentation sir uh, i think it concludes both the presentations uh, i think the participants can uh, can put their questions in the chat box or they can also unmute themselves and they can go ahead with question uh, so currently there, there is one one query in the chat box i i will read out sir uh, is one comment and one one query is there how do you manage the caregiving difficulties like repetitive questioning wandering and incontinence which do not respond to cholinesterol inhibitors uh, there also a comment that managing frontotemporal dementia is very difficult yeah so uh, some of these uh, behaviors that uh, uh, you have mentioned are definitely challenging which cannot be managed by medication and there's no point just giving a high dose of uh, antipsychotic or something to you know make them sleep or something and uh, some of those uh, strategies are uh, a little dangerous also because uh, antipsychotics um, especially some of these antipsychotics given in um, uh, dementia there is also an fpi black box uh, warning in terms of how much you can use uh, so say for example wandering is something that is a very common and very distressing uh, uh, symptom that people uh, come up with and it's important to actually um, have some kind of id on the person uh, who has dementia so that in case they get lost uh, you know there is always an id and there is they are carrying an id with them uh, so th th these are some of the uh, simple things that can be done um, in terms of incontinence i guess again incontinence is uh, you you might also look at you know having a regular visit to the bathroom for this person rather than wait for uh, this person to come and tell you because they are not going to do that or they might have forgotten how to do that they might have forgotten where is the bathroom and they might have uh, you know uh, Uh, peed in in the living room. So uh, it, it is important for us to realize that maybe just like how we take a child every few hours to the restroom, we might have to take them to the restroom uh, before they actually uh, reach out to us. So th these are some of the things that you might have to do. Uh, repetitive questioning, yes, it again can be uh, an issue in um, some of the dementias, like say frontotemporal dementia. The repetitive questioning. is um, uh, also part of the repetitive behavior and maybe in some of those condition you might want to maybe consider a necessary but repetitive questioning can also be a problem in uh, other dementias or alzheimers dementia because of memory issues and often uh, we might get frustrated we might get uh, you know hooked on to uh, them and we might uh, lash back so Uh, one of the things that you might have to tell caregivers is to not to uh, retaliate back. Uh, sir, there is a break in your voice. hello i think dr santosh sir has faced i think a technical glitch i think uh, this microphone we are not able to hear uh, can we uh, this one more question to dr keshav sir Uh, so the participant has asked a question. Uh, does Nimhans Geriatric Department offer online cognitive training and cognitive stimulation for patients from other states? I even to ask for online if the training is good. Is the services are there? We have just started the web-based training, which is an interactive one. So cognitive training we have just started, but uh, not the cognitive stimulation. We just need to evolve a method to kind of uh, uh, do it online. But we would like to do it eventually. Okay. Uh, I, I hope it has answered the I think participant query. Uh, any more questions? Please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Or else you can uh, type in the chat box. We will take up your questions.
I think there are no queries in the in YouTube also, sir. No, in the chat box of YouTube also, there are no questions. Uh, just I have one query, sir, to Dr. Keshav, sir. The habit model you presented during a presentation, uh, hmm. it, it looks like a multi-model. It has a physical component, it is a cognitive component, it also has family component also is there. How effective was it, sir, in, uh, in patients with MCI, especially for two-week intervention it is? So, it is a very intensive program. I think it is effective because it looks at all the aspects. Cognitive retraining also produces quite a bit of change. So does physical exercise, Tai Chi, there are multiple methods of enhancing and this is a combination of it. So I think it is effective and uh, the changes also could be lasting. Thank you, sir, for the reply. And, uh, and, and uh, Dr. Santosh is mentioning about, uh, uh, about, a, about a booklet, a caregiver booklet for, uh, from Alzheimer's International. Recently, geriatric link services have translated this in, for English version into Canada version also. With the help of our friends in the social work department, we have translated into even Canada version also. Uh, this is for a kind of information. Uh, uh, to Dr. Keshav, sir, there is another query, sir, for you. Uh, is there any short-term courses on this for clinical psychology to get better trained in management of dementia? We ask a particular question for a management of dementia or giving any specific training. Not as of now. This is but, of uh, some of the cognitive uh, training uh, program that we have developed, uh, it is free of cost and anybody can ask for uh, the program. And uh, if they write to us, we will give you a program that can be downloaded on uh, mobile phones, Android apps. So they can use that instead. Uh, right now, we don't have any uh, program for uh, online program for uh, public. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, as I told, any request is there, sir, I will uh, happy to share with you the module. I think, sir, uh, I think I just about 450 already, sir. Uh, shall we wind up, sir? Just two things to add, Chetanya uh, Shivashankar. Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Professor Keshav covered mainly the cognitive therapies. Yes, sir. Uh, especially cognitive uh, retraining and simulation and all that. But there's also individual therapy which you can offer for people uh, who are in the early stages of dementia. So we need to remember that supportive therapy, mindfulness, and various other kinds of interventions for helping with their depression. Uh, Keshav okay, so wouldn't have had time to cover that because it's quite a lot to cover. And uh, second thing about the second talk, uh, uh, Dr. Santosh mentioned it in passing, but I think one of the things to do is to approach Alzheimer associations in uh, different parts of the country. Uh, almost every state has an Alzheimer chapter, so it's good to approach. So a group support model is also something that is useful. In, uh, especially for family members and also in the early stages in people who have dementia. Thank you. I think uh, both of them did an extensive presentation. So thank you very much, both of you. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Santosh sir just joined, I think, some connection break or way. Uh, yes, sir, you can unmute sir, yourself. Yes, sir. Okay. There are no further questions, sir. Actually, there is a comment from Matthew, sir, about uh, I mean, suggestion from Matthew, sir, about the individual interventions, apart from the cognitive intervention for people with patients with dementia and caregivers. Uh, So any, any more comments from you, sir? I think there are no more comments, sir, from the chat box I have seen both in YouTube also and Zoom also. Uh, I think people ask about uh, the module which sir has mentioned. Apart from that, there are no questions, actually. I think but what sir mentioned, the eye support program is a very useful inter useful program actually for the clinicians themselves to read actually the components. Uh, I think uh, uh, it, is a, it is a very good uh, program for the caregivers actually. If they, if they could go through the, now the program online is not there, but they can actually go through the, the articles which the sir has mentioned, the components of it.
sir uh, santosh sir and kesho sir shall we wind up sir we will uh... sure sure okay. uh, i thank all the participants for their uh, patient listening uh, and also for the, for the queries and active listening uh, thank you i meet you next week on same same time yes sir